Yuma, having played a pivotal role in securing victory for Duran's forces in the recent battle, now stands before Duran himself. The atmosphere crackles with anticipation as the two share a moment that could reshape Yuma's destiny. Duran, in his grandeur, offers Yuma a significant token of his appreciation, the legendary sword Ascalon. This magnificent weapon, forged from the exceptionally rare Serokan heavy steel, carries a legacy as rich as its steel is rare. Its steel, said to be capable of cutting or breaking anything in the world, makes it the stuff of legends. Yuma gazes at it, considering its weight, both literally and figuratively, for in his hands, it could mean a world of change. In a surprising turn, Duran introduces an intriguing twist to the deal. He proposes that in exchange for the sword, Yuma should become his adopted son. This, however, isn't a mere offer, it's a gambit. Yuma can sense that this proposition isn't just about familial bonds, it's about political power and leverage. Yuma, quick-witted and perceptive, doesn't fall for this carefully laid trap. He acknowledges the value of Ascalon, but resolutely refuses the adoption. His heart lies with the Pong Merchant Union, and he's not willing to trade that newly found family for a blade, no matter how legendary. Yuma, undeterred, counters with another offer, an apprenticeship. Duran, in his usual whimsical manner, sees this as a challenge. He's a master of the long game, and decides that having Yuma as an apprentice might eventually lead to the desired adoption. This exchange, however, isn't just about a sword. It's about power dynamics and the intricate dance of politics. Duran's willingness to part with Ascalon, a symbol of might and prestige, speaks volumes about his regard for Yuma. It's also a testament to Yuma's newly found significance in this complex world of nobility and power. Amidst this banter, there's a looming shadow, the second battlefield. Duran's ominous warning to Yuma about the impending peril serves as a stark reminder that their world isn't just about swords and strategies, but is fraught with real dangers and consequences. Their journey takes them to the Haseo Nation's camp, where they encounter Commander Hechizo. Hechizo, understandably cautious, questions their motives for appearing unannounced. Duran, never one to shy away from a challenge, suggests a knightly duel to prove their mettle. However, Hechizo, displaying equal caution and shrewdness, proposes a condition. If Aseo wins, they'll claim Duran's head. Duran, with his trademark confidence and a hint of audacity, accepts this condition, setting the stage for a duel that could decide not just their fates, but the balance of power in this intricate political landscape. Back at their camp, Yuma confronts Duran about his seemingly cavalier attitude. Yuma is the voice of reason, urging Duran to consider the gravity of his actions. Duran, with his characteristic wit, dismisses Yuma's concerns, convinced that he's unbeatable. But Yuma, not one to blindly follow, realizes the danger of Duran's overconfidence. He prepares himself for a possible ambush by Duran's knights. As they encircle him, Yuma makes a bold decision. He decides to take destiny into his own hands, forsaking caution and protocol. With determination burning in his eyes, he charges straight towards Duran. Randall, the enigmatic figure at Duran's side, stepped forward to intercept Yuma's attack, setting the stage for an electrifying duel. Blades clashed in a symphony of steel, the air crackling with anticipation. Randall, a formidable adversary with skills that could eclipse the sun, pushed Yuma to the very edge of his capabilities. In the end, in an unexpected twist, it was Yuma who emerged triumphant. Randall, crushed by the weight of defeat and the shame it brought, made a startling request. He asked Yuma to deliver the coup de grace, to spare him the indignity of facing Duran after such a resounding loss. Yet, Yuma's response was nothing short of astonishing. Instead of capitalizing on Randall's vulnerability, he extended words of admiration and respect for the fierce combat they had just waged. This refusal to exploit a fallen foe showcased Yuma's character in its purest form. He was more than a warrior. He was a person who revered honor and appreciated the value of a true challenge. Amidst the echoes of this intense clash, Duran decided it was time to pull the reins. He summoned a medic to tend to Yuma's wounds, revealing an unexpected concern for his apprentice. 
This abrupt shift in Duran's demeanor left a lingering question mark hanging in the air. As Yuma received the much needed medical care, Duran let a few hints slip about his intentions. He pointed out that had Yuma's attack failed earlier, he would have danced upon the precipice of death. Furthermore, Duran insinuated that facing Randall wielding both his swords would have been akin to attempting the impossible. The disparity in their skills loomed like a mountain range before Yuma. Duran extended a proposition to Yuma, a path to transcend Randall's formidable prowess. He offered a choice, three years as an apprentice, or a shorter journey of two years as his adopted son to surpass Randall in combat. Yuma, staying true to his principles and allegiance to the Puang Merchant Union, chose the longer path, pledging his dedication. But Duran was a master of surprise. He suddenly launched an attack on Yuma, striking him on the already injured shoulder. Yuma's cry of anguish pierced the air, but Duran, always the unorthodox mentor, turned this into a crucial lesson. He emphasized the necessity of readiness, control over one's body, and the power of mastering the subconscious mind. Yuma, baffled by Duran's relentless training techniques, couldn't help but contemplate a counter move. Maybe it was time to give Duran a taste of his own medicine. Driven by determination, Yuma hatched a daring plan to sneak into Duran's tent one fateful night and attempt an assassination while the nobleman slumbered. Yet, in an unpredictable twist, Duran outwitted Yuma, orchestrating a beating that delivered a brutal lesson in humility. Duran's guards arrived swiftly, escorting a battered and defeated Yuma away, leaving him nursing not only physical wounds, but also a bruised ego. Two hours later, the cycle began anew as Yuma found himself back on the training grounds, ready to endure more grueling lessons. Duran, with a resolute demeanor, declared that Yuma's training would now involve a six-day period of fasting. Yuma's shock and outcry were met with Duran's unwavering conviction that six days without food wouldn't kill a man, but would instead forge his mental fortitude. As if hunger weren't enough, Duran piled on another layer to Yuma's training. He instructed Yuma to count the blades of grass in the field, using his aura to envelop each blade while keeping his eyes closed. It was a task that seemed insurmountable, an exercise in patience and control that pushed the boundaries of Yuma's abilities. Initially overwhelmed by the sheer audacity of this request, Yuma soon discovered that Duran's mastery extended beyond the ordinary. What seemed impossible became attainable as Duran unveiled the extraordinary extent of his aura manipulation abilities. Yuma began to grasp the immense chasm that separated them in strength and skill. He reluctantly acknowledged Duran's unparalleled power. As days transformed into nights, Yuma's training escalated. He pushed himself to the brink, enduring the pains of hunger and exhaustion while refining his skills. On the sixth day, as night descended like a heavy curtain, Yuma's body succumbed to fatigue and he collapsed, seemingly lifeless, pushed to the very edge of his limits. Yet, as the tendrils of slumber loosened their grip, Yuma was startled to find himself beneath an endless expanse of cerulean sky. Duran, it seemed, had wielded an unconventional elixir infused with the enigmatic essence of ogre blood to drag Yuma back from the brink. The young warrior's revived existence stirred a perplexing mixture of gratitude and disbelief. Duran, his laughter tinged with the pride of an unconventional mentor, confessed to harboring doubts about the potion's efficacy, making Yuma's revival all the more remarkable. Duran acknowledged Yuma's incredible feat, surviving six grueling days of torment with a sense of satisfaction. Their focus, however, shifted toward the next phase of training, battle. With unwavering determination burning in his eyes, Duran beckoned Yuma to join him, ready to impart the next profound lesson on this extraordinary odyssey. Their journey led them to the commander, and Duran inquired whether a formidable adversary had been chosen to face Yuma. The commander, well aware of the staggering stakes, affirmed that his very life hung in the balance of Yuma's prowess, a reminder that the impending battle was no mere contest of skill, but a duel with life-altering consequences. A sentinel from the opposing commander's camp intervened, solemnly emphasizing the sanctity of this impending battle of the knights. The terms were set. The loser would yield and withdraw. If Sir Haseo's side faltered, they would escort Duran and his troops to the Haseo nation. Conversely, if Sir Kyle's forces found themselves on the losing end, 
they would submit to any action dictated by the Haseo nation. Yuma, to his astonishment, discovered that his adversary was none other than Tensu, the pulverizer of the snowfield, a living legend in his own right. Tensu's reputation was a formidable shadow that loomed large, especially regarding his previous clash with Chunan Romindi, a confrontation that had left Chunan grievously wounded. The ensuing battle was a spectacle, a clash of titans with the Empire's destiny hanging precipitously in the balance. Yuma's unwavering resolve, coupled with his exceptional combat prowess, converged in a breathtaking crescendo. The final strike, swift and unerring, rendered Tenzu incapacitated. The commander's disbelief mirrored the seismic shockwaves that rippled through the audience, heralding Yuma's triumph. The war concluded bloodlessly, with the Empire's troops abstaining from shedding a single drop of blood. The news of this unprecedented resolution unfurled across the Empire like wildfire igniting a jubilant wave of celebration for the triumphant return of its troops. At the palace banquet, set amidst the sumptuous display of opulent delicacies and jubilation, Yuma found himself atop the palace, his fingers tracing the familiar contours of the railing. The irony of his presence in this hallowed place, once a cornerstone of his life, left him in a contemplative reverie. Yet, as he pondered, the tranquility of the palace was sundered by an unexpected interruption Hella Rose, a figure of striking allure and determination. Her sudden appearance rattled Yuma's equilibrium, and her probing questions regarding the ogre's blood and his intentions cut through the festive atmosphere like a knife. Hella Rose, fervent in her demands for transparency, issued a stern warning, vowing to staunchly oppose Yuma if she perceived any hint of manipulation or exploitation of the ogre's blood. With the curtain closing on chapter 11, the stage was set for a confluence of intrigue and confrontation. Yuma's enigmatic connection with Hella Rose and the tantalizing mystery surrounding the ogre's blood cast lingering shadows of uncertainty over his path. The narrative throbbed with unresolved questions, setting a scene for a revelation of monumental proportions that would shape the trajectory of Yuma's destiny. The air seemed charged with an unspoken tension as Yuma and Hella Rose stood in the palace's regal courtyard. Their exchange was a dance of intrigue, where words held the power to shape destinies. Hello Rose's eyes, pools of determination and suspicion, locked on to Yuma's with relentless intensity. You drank ogre blood, she asserted, her voice with a velvet steel blend, both compelling and commanding. Yuma, facing this inquisition, felt the weight of her scrutiny. He understood that the ogre's blood was no ordinary elixir. It held secrets, mysteries, and potentially unimaginable power. His reply had to be both honest and cautious. Yes, he admitted, his tone steady. Duran offered it to me, and I accepted. Hello Rose's gaze didn't waver, nor did her demeanor soften. Why? she demanded, her eyes searching his soul for the truth. Yuma, feeling a surge of unease, took a moment to compose his response. I don't know the full extent of what Ogre's blood can do, but Duran believed it would help me. He explained. I didn't want to die counting blades of grass, and Duron, unconventional as he is, saved my life. Her skepticism lingered, but there was a flicker of understanding in her eyes. Duron is a complex man, driven by his own motives. What are yours? She asked, probing deeper. Yuma's thoughts swirled like a tempest. The allure of power, the tantalizing prospect of becoming more than he was, these whispers had crossed his mind. But he couldn't reveal such doubts to this enigmatic woman. Instead, he chose his words carefully. My motives are my own, but I assure you, they are aligned with the best interests of the Haseo nation. Hello, Rose, seemingly satisfied with his response, nodded slowly. Very well, Yuma. I will be watching you closely. The ogre's blood is not a gift to be taken lightly. It has the power to change the course of nations. Yuma's mysterious smile as he gazes at Hella Rose is the prelude to a series of revelations and challenges that will reshape his path. His thoughts, hidden behind that cryptic expression, are a whirlwind of emotions. He remembers Hella as the one who saved him multiple times in his previous life, but also as someone indirectly responsible for his past demise. This dual perspective on Hella, a mix of gratitude and the weight of his past, it's brilliantly depicted in that enigmatic smile. 
It's a smile that says, you've saved me, but you've also been a part of my undoing. As Yuma gazes at her, his smile becomes a riddle that Hela is determined to decipher. Hela's curiosity leads her to question Yuma's inexplicable amusement. She presses for an explanation, but Yuma's response remains vague. It's nothing, he says, the weight of his unspoken thoughts echoing in silence. This simple exchange holds layers of complexity and hidden histories. Yuma's calm demeanor as he reveals his reason for consuming the ogre's blood conceals a poignant memory. His parents, victims of a brutal magic bombardment, had perished, and the one who had shielded him from that storm was none other than Sir Kale Fabian. It's a story that tugs at the heartstrings, and the narrative masterfully conveys the depth of Yuma's gratitude and the trauma of his past. But the plot takes a riveting turn as a mysterious woman named Zishka Rose challenges this well-established narrative. Her voice drips with intrigue as she approaches, casting doubt on Yuma's story. Hela, now even more intrigued, joins forces with her sister in supporting her claims. Yuma, caught in the crossfire of these revelations, finds himself muttering, I am screwed. The sisters, with their conflicting accounts, create a web of doubt and confusion around Yuma's past. It's a moment of tension, where loyalties are questioned, and the allure of an enigmatic past casts its spell. Yet, Yuma is no mere pawn in this familial feud. His past, intertwined with multiple rescues and shifting alliances, is a truth he bears with stoicism. Yuma's confession, though earnest, is met with skepticism from the first princess. However, when he offers a potential bridge, sharing a drink with Adeline, it's a simple gesture that could potentially bridge the gap of disbelief. Zishka seizes this opportunity, suggesting that she'd like to join in on the drink. But, in her characteristic style, she turns it into a challenge. A drinking contest like no other. This is no ordinary drinking game. It's a battle of endurance. Her conditions are clear. Yuma must finish an entire barrel of liquor before she sips the remnants of her glass of wine. The crowd watches in awe as the game begins, with her sister voicing concerns about the extreme nature of the challenge. The audience is riveted as Yuma's astounding capacity for alcohol defies all expectations. He effortlessly downs the massive barrel of wine in mere seconds, leaving even Zishka taken aback. But the challenge starts losing its allure as Yuma's determination and formidable capacity become all too evident. Zishka, however, is not one to back down easily. She raises the stakes, urging anyone in the crowd to step forward and challenge Yuma. Hela's honor is wagered on him, while Zishka boldly bets on any potential challenger. The victor, they declare, will get to impose a request on the loser. Hela and Zishka's interactions add a layer of complexity to the chapter. Zishka's provocative thoughts, Hela's unwavering determination, and the brewing tension between them create a dynamic backdrop to Yuma's incredible drinking feat. As the drinking game unfolds, the spotlight on Yuma intensifies. His capacity to withstand the liquor becomes a symbol of his resilience and determination. The crowd, initially mere spectators, become increasingly invested in the outcome. The tension in the air is palpable, and the stakes continue to rise. Zishka, in her pursuit of a worthy challenge, raises the bar once more. She invites anyone willing to challenge Yuma, turning a simple drinking game into a grand spectacle. Zishka, in her audacity, provokes her sister further, wagering her honor on Yuma's prowess. It's a move that not only escalates the challenge, but also hints at the complexities of their sibling rivalry. The chapter's climax arrives as the challenger finally steps forward from the shadows. With Duran overseeing the battle ceremony, the challenger is none other than Chunin Romandi, renowned for his family spearsmanship, but infamous for his defeat against Tensu. Yuma can't help but question Chunin's understanding of the situation, considering he was the one who decisively defeated Tensu with a single blow. Doubts linger in the air, and tension escalates as the crowd waits with bated breath. Chunin, courteous and composed, kisses the first princess's hand, signaling the start of the battle. Zishka's taunts add an element of intrigue, suggesting that Hela might be the first princess to have a commoner kiss her hand. But Hela, in a moment that defies convention and royal decorum, bends down and plants a kiss on top of Yuma's head. The audacious kiss bestowed upon Yuma by Princess Hela is a seismic event, shaking the very foundations of the Empire's hierarchical norms. In that fleeting moment, the balance of power shifts, and the palace becomes a theater for the redefinition of rules and expectations. 
Zishka, caught between familial royalty and the disbelief of her sister's actions, watches in dumbfounded awe. Her sister's act of defiance symbolizes an irreversible change in the Empire's dynamics. It marks the moment when Yuma evolves from a mere commoner to an influential player in the political chessboard. Hela's parting words to Yuma carry a complex blend of challenge and concern. They signify a delicate web of expectations and respect that surrounds him. Yuma's measured response veils a trace of unease stemming from the mammoth barrel of wine he downed earlier. He now wears a crown of responsibility that seems as heavy as the Empire itself. Inside the palace's heart, Yuma and Chunin, the celebrated spearsmen, stand at the precipice of a duel. Tension hangs in the air like a charged storm, and Chunin, sharing tales of past battles and his recent encounter with 500 foes before facing Tensu, seeks to establish his invincibility. This battle promises to be a crucible of challenges that will test Yuma's mettle. Yuma has an astute observation about Chunin's motivations. Ah, so that's why you accepted the challenge. The duel ignites with an intensity that rivals the blaze of a phoenix. Yuma's acrobatic grace and precision showcased in his flawless evasion of Chunin's relentless attacks paint a vivid portrait of his exceptional combat skills. Chunin, on the other hand, finds himself rattled by Yuma's unwavering pursuit, convinced that he won't hold back. Then comes the unexpected twist, a twist that sends ripples throughout the hall. Yuma's sword, the symbol of his prowess, shatters upon impact, revealing that it had been tampered with. Swiftly, Yuma adapts, discarding the broken weapon and using his aura-infused fists to gain an advantage. It's a testament to Yuma's adaptability and resourcefulness, portraying him as a warrior who thrives in even the direst circumstances. Zishka's vehement outburst accusing Yuma of illegal aura usage adds layers of complexity to the scene. Her protests fall on deaf ears, even among the nobility, and the Empress's reaction further underscores Zishka's decline from grace. It's a pivotal moment that hints at a darker path for Zishka, driven by her unquenchable thirst for power. The Empress's shocking slap across Zishka's face, an event that sends shockwaves throughout the palace, signifies the Empire's weakening authority. Her frustration with her daughter's actions and her favoritism towards Duron are laid bare for all to see. This monumental incident leaves an indelible mark on the nobility, solidifying Yuma's unforeseen influence. Yuma, compelled by his unwavering honesty, admits to using aura, but shrewdly points out the tampering of his sword. This revelation casts Yuma in the light of an honorable figure amidst the intricate power struggles of the palace. His integrity shines through, illuminating the gathering darkness. The chapter takes a deep dive into the Empire's intricate power dynamics, peeling back the layers of secrecy and hidden agendas. A clandestine meeting between a knight and Grand Duke Winzelting hints at a covert scheme in motion. The Grand Duke's cryptic inquiries about Zishka and his enigmatic laughter foreshadow an impending storm of political intrigue. It's a tantalizing glimpse into the shadowy recesses of power, leaving readers hungry for revelations yet to come. Under the cloak of night, Yuma's contemplations reveal his growing awareness of the intricate machinations around him. Despite earning Duran's favor and gaining the respect of the nobles, a lingering sense of unease gnaws at him. A scene that leaves readers yearning for the next revelation of the prodigious Swordmaster. Hey guys, glad you made it to the end of the video. If you liked it, you already know to comment Swordmaster below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.